I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the Old Testament to the book of 1 Kings. First Kings chapter 16. This is our scripture reading and the text for our sermon this evening. First Kings 16, I remind you that this is the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of our God. So let us give our attention to its reading. And the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Basha, saying, Since I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Basha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Anyone belonging to Basha who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat, and any one and any one of his who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Now the rest of the acts of Basha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Basha slept with his fathers and was buried at Tirzah, and Elah his son reigned in his place. Moreover, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Basha and against his house, both because of all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, the son of Basha, began to reign over Israel in Tirzah, and he reigned two years. But his servant, Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him when he was at Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arzah, who was over the household in Tirzah, Zimri came in and struck him down and killed him in the 27th year of Esau, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And he began, when he began to reign, as soon as he had seated himself on his throne, he struck down all the house of Basha. He did not leave him a single male of his relatives or his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Basha according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Basha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Basha and the sins of Elah his son which they sinned and which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. For the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? In the 27th year of Esau, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days in Tirzah. Now the troops were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the troops who were encamped heard it said, Zimri has conspired and he has killed the king. Therefore all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. So Omri went up from Gibbethon, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. And when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house, and burned the king's house over him with fire, and died, because of his sins that he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sins which he committed, making Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and the conspiracy that he made, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnah, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginnah. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Esau, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years, Six years he reigned in Tirzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. And he fortified the hill and called the name of the city that he built Samaria after the name of Shemar, the owner of the hill. Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sins that he made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. But the rest of the acts of Omri that he did, and the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his place. In the 38th year of Esau, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri began to reign over Israel, and Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him 
he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our study tonight. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you've given to us your word. And as we turn our attention now to this chapter, difficult as it is to hear over and over again the way in which Israel provoked their God. Lord, may we see in this chapter the reminder of your goodness and faithfulness. And most of all, O oh Lord, may we see what it is that sin deserves and that wrath that has been poured out, propitiated upon our Savior, Jesus Christ. In all of this, Lord, would you, would you increase our faith and our understanding, increase our love for you, our devotion, that it might mark all of our days. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We come this evening to a challenging chapter, as I just prayed. It is one that I have wrestled with over this past week in some ways because it seems to be uh, one of those chapters where the author of the book is just sort of trying to move us along very, very quickly in order to get to where he wants us to be. In other words, uh, this chapter sort of is, is, is a slide of northern kingdom of Israel down into wickedness until it comes to Ahab, and Ahab will take up the rest of First Kings. We'll be looking at Ahab and his relationship to Elijah the Tishbite uh, and, and the various things that take place in Israel over the next weeks. And so I find it interesting that, that so much is devoted to Ahab, so much was devoted to Jeroboam, but here in the, in, in the middle, if you will, well, we, we run through five kings. One, it seems, more wicked than the one before him. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, Ahab comes along. So this is our challenge tonight, to understand this chapter and to see where it fits in the study of redemptive history. Remember, as we've looked in previous chapters, we've talked about how, how, how the Old Testament history books are not regular, bare history. There's much history in them. They, they are, in fact, historical, but they have been selected and inspired by the Lord in order to, prevent, to, to give to us what it is that we need, to, we need to understand about the Old Testament leading us to the New Testament. That is, what we need to understand as we come to Jesus Christ. And one aspect of studying redemptive history, then, is studying the trail of sin that brings God's judgment. Covenant curses are important to the story ever since the beginning. Ever since sin entered. Remember, in the very beginning, when God made a covenant with Adam there in the Garden of Eden, he told him that you may surely eat of the tree, uh, of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day, in the day which you eat of it, you shall surely die. A covenant curse is threatened right there in the beginning in what we call that covenant of works. Curses are part of the covenant. We see this also in Genesis 6, in the, in the lead up to the flood, when the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the curse that came was, in a sense, the deconstructing of the world, the uncreating and then recreating the world through the flood. And we've seen this also in the Mosaic Covenant. Deuteronomy, pardon me, Deuteronomy 4, verses 23 and 24. Moses tells the people, Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now this idea of covenant curse and, 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 and truly what sin deserves, we've already been seeing this play out in Kings thus far. As we've witnessed Solomon's fall and the kings that have followed in his steps, whether Rehoboam or Jeroboam, while their sins were, were, were peculiarly their own, there was a pattern to them. They turned away from the Lord and they turned the people further away from God. 
indeed turned them, turned them away from their God. What is striking about our chapter before us is that it is a continual refrain provoking the Lord their God to anger, the Lord, the God of Israel to anger. Even though Israel has turned away from God, God has not ceased to hold them accountable. Indeed, we can say that, that the notion of a covenant requires him to hold them accountable. Without that accountability, without calling them to account for themselves and for their sin, the covenant is meaningless. And so they turn further and further away from God. And last week we considered the reign of three kings, Abijam, Asa, and the beginning of Basha. We saw the way that the Lord had kept the lamp in Jerusalem for the sake of David. That light in the darkness that leads to the promised deliverer who is the light of the world. The lamp then was never about David, but about great David's greater son. The light of Christ shines through the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Wherever we are in the story of redemption, we have comfort in this great truth, and we can follow that light to see how God is working his purposes. And this is good, because it gets darker in our chapter Darker than we saw last week. Darker as Israel descends further and further into sin. Tonight's chapter focuses our attention on five kings. Five kings with tumultuous reigns. There's very little stability here in this chapter. And even when it does come, at the end of the chapter, it will come for the king who would bring more sin than any other to date. In our chapter, we learn the truth that sin leads to both short-term and long-term tragedy. The wages of sin is death, and that death is worked out oftentimes slowly and painfully. And that's what the chapter before us tonight is about. It's about slow and it's painful. Now it's quicker than living it, of course, as it spans nearly 40 years of Israel's history. But it's one bad king after another. One bad king after another. Indeed, we can say, on the one hand, what we see here in this chapter is the Lord being provoked to anger more and more and more. And yet what we see on the other hand is the truth of how God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 34. That he is a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Our task tonight is to follow the main lines of these kings of these kingdoms or these reigns and then come to consider the point of this chapter and how it fits in the story of redemption and so speaks good news to us. So we begin with the line of Basha. The line of Basha, and if you notice, there's actually something that frames this chapter. It was very helpful to me as I was working my way through and putting this sermon together this week, is that it's framed by a declaration of the Word of God. The Word of God at the very beginning, coming through Jehu, uh, and the Word of God coming at the end, citing the Word of God from Joshua. But the point being, it's the Word of the Lord that, that sort of frames this chapter and that's good, by the way, because again, there is so much, uh, uh, so much darkness in this chapter that were it not for the word of God, we might wonder if God was extinguished altogether here. But no, God is working. God is leading. God is, in fact, uh, uh, um, uh, not being sort of pushed around and driven about, but rather this is part of his redemptive plan. And so we see first the word, that prophetic word from Jehu, the son of Hanani, that comes to Basha. And the word that comes uh, is a word of judgment, which again is not surprising. And this word of judgment that reminds us of the word of judgment that came against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the word of judgment that had come previously to Abijam. The text explains to us what that word is, that, that, that uh, Basha did not respond to God's raising him up out of the dust, right? Since I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel the sin, provoking me to anger with their sin. He was ungrateful, but also he was idolatrous. He continued to offer sacrifices to the golden calves, those calves that Jeroboam had made and had declared, here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. He provoked the Lord. And look down at verse 7. We see there further that God judges Basha for destroying the house of Jeroboam. Well, this might confuse us. 
After all, it was God's command. God had spoken a word to, uh, um, uh, to Basha that he was, in fact, going to be destroyed. But it was still Basha's sin. His pride, then, is the issue. For had he been a righteous man, his destruction of the house of Jeroboam would have been regarded as a divine mission. Since he was just as evil as the man he had killed, his act was only motivated by personal ambition. And for this reason, he stood condemned before God. Much like Nebuchadnezzar at a later date, who would look out over Babylon and say, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Well, notice the judgment that comes against Basha here in our text. It's the same thing that befalls Jeroboam's house. He would be cut off. There would be no dynasty. Now this helps us to think about God's wrath. God's anger is not like our anger, that anger of ours that is often mixed in motive and the result of rashness on our part. God's wrath is a reaction of his holiness when confronted with sin. God's wrath can make us uncomfortable and if God's wrath makes us uncomfortable, then reading this chapter is one of those chapters that we're going to wrestle with as we read about the people provoking the Lord, their God, to anger. And so it can be tempting to skip these accounts of God's wrath. But as we've said in the past, that, that you can't understand the cross properly, what it is that Jesus accomplishes without understanding the wrath of God that is due for sin. As J. Gerson Machen writes, religion cannot be made joyful simply by looking on the bright side of God. For a one-sided God is not a real God, and it is the real God alone who can satisfy the longing of our soul. And we can add to that, it's the real God alone who can save us from our sins. And so we must take into account the wrath of God. And we see Basha's judgment in our text. It goes much quicker after this. All of the evil that he had done, provoking the Lord there in verse 7. He dies. Elah, his son, reigns in his place. And the transfer of power seems peaceful enough. His son becomes king. And here we see something of God's mercy, even in the midst of declared judgment. The house of Basha would fall, but not while Basha was king. The doom is, not, is predicted, but it is delayed. In God's mercy, he allows time for repentance, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 2 and verse 4. But it comes upon Elah, and his reign is short. We see the judgment against him there in verse 8, that he reigned two years. And indeed, the shortness of his reign was part of the judgment against Basha. His house would be cut off, not at its height, but rather there at its beginning. And look at the way that it happens. Again, this is, this is sort of uh, heaping on the, 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 the reason for and the reality of the judgment. We're told that Zimri, the commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. We're not given a lot of details about what that conspiracy looked like or the way it went about. All we know is that Elah was at Tirzah drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza. And Zimri comes in and strikes him down and kills him. If only, if, if only Elah had listened to the words of Proverbs 31. It is not for kings. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Well, Zimri, for his part, he comes in swiftly and he begins to reign swiftly. And that rain happens so quickly. We are told, uh, first of all, that he destroys the house of Basha there in verses 11 and following. He struck down all the house. Not only, did he, not, not only did he strike down all the house, but he also cut off all of his male relatives and his friends. It was all according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoke by, against Basha by Jehu, the prophet. He destroys them all. To look what happens next. This transitions us into our second point, what we call Zimri's reign. We can't call it a line of Zimri because he only reigns for seven days. That's it. 
which is, I mean, in one hand, kind of remarkable, right? That Zimri, the most spectacularly unsuccessful king in all of Israel's history, not only does he not put a son on the throne of Israel, but he himself also fails to reign for more than a week. Seven days. But that means that all of his actions that we've read of before, all of his actions against the house of Basha would have been swift. Perhaps that's meant to drive home the notion of the conspiracy. It was put in place already, and then it was carried out quickly. But Zimri's reign will not last. As I said, it lasts only seven days. For we read of Omri's actions. We read that Israel made Omri the commander, uh, made Omri the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. Zimri's coup was, we can say, a military one, but there's a greater military leader who rises up. In a sense, this is a bit like a colonel seizing power only for a general to hear of it and respond by himself taking power. So we read that Omri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him and they besieged Tirzah, verse 17. Now the scene is, is an interesting one. If you, we were to look back at all the passages where this is mentioned, what we would learn is that the troops were dispatched and were warring with the Philistines. And the siege that they were at there at Gibbethon went on intermittently for 24 years. But it's paused here because of Zimri's actions. It's paused here because Omri seizes control. And that brings us then to Zimri's death. We read there in verse 18 that when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire and died because of his sins that he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sin which he committed, making, in, making Israel to sin. Zimri saw that he could not prevail, and in seeing that, he took his own life. What's of interest is that we see that the judgment against him is clear. He also walked in the sins of Jeroboam, and he also made Israel to sin. The scriptures certainly make the point that the, that the anarchy in the north was the bitter fruit of Jeroboam's apostasy. What I want us to see in that, in that sense is what this chapter teaches us is the way that sin seems to beget more sin. It's not as though there's a wicked king and then a righteous king and then two wicked kings and a righteous king. That's the way that the, that the southern kingdom is going to go. And yes, it is true that they too will go away into exile. But here we see in the north that they do not have, they, they not only don't have a good righteous king, but each one seems to be worse than the one before them. The law reigned for only two years. We read that Zimri reigned only seven days. We could say, and we, we would be tempted to say, that the shortness of their reign was in fact the judgment against them. I said that it was a sign of the judgment. We could say it was the judgment, but that's not true necessarily. For what could be worse than having a wicked king who reigns a short time? Worse would be a wicked king who reigns a long time and puts in place his wickedness more and more and leads the people further and further away from the Lord. And that's what we see in Omri's dynasty. He doesn't reign merely like Zimri and Basha before him. He establishes a dynasty that will last 50 years. To the nations around the world, Israel would actually be called the House of Omri. It would include Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, Joram, and Adaliah. All of these kings would come from the reign, from the line of Omri, and would push the people of God further and further away from the Lord, deeper and deeper into their sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger. This word that is repeated throughout the entire chapter, we see it here, repeated again. It begins with the struggle. It wasn't a swift and easy military coup on the part of Omri. And perhaps we could say that that makes sense. After all, Omri had heard about Zimri's coup, and so he just overcooed him, whatever that word would be. He just decided to go in and, and, and to one-up Zimri. But we read also of Tibni, another one. For the kingdom of Israel is divided into two parts. The kingdom that was already divided is divided further. And half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ganoth, to make him king. And half followed Omri. And we don't know exactly what followed. We can, we can kind of guess, given the fact that the, the history so far has been violent and bloody. 
We can assume that it would follow that it was a violent and bloody back and forth between Tibni and Omri. All we are told is that the people who followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ganah. And so Tibni died and Omri became king. Now we're actually not told much else about Tibni, in fact anything else about Tibni in Scripture except here in 1 Kings 16. We're not told about the rivalry, but as I said, we can assume that it ended badly for Tibni. Indeed, once the hereditary, hereditary principle, that is, going from the line of David down to his son, once that was overthrown in the northern kingdom of Israel, the crown became a prize to be possessed by the strongest. The struggle lasted four or five years, it seems, between Omri and Tibni. And what is the result of this battle? The result, as I said, is, is quite spectacular as Omri establishes a dynasty. He begins to reign, and he reigned for 12 years. And for six of those years, he reigned in Tirzah. But for the other six years, he reigned in Samaria, the city that he himself would found, the city that he would buy and that he would fortify, that he would establish. Indeed, this would be the name given to the people in the generations to come, the Samaritans. This is why they would be called Samaritans, because the capital was there in Samaria. Extra-biblical sources, that is, outside of Scripture, mention Omri. In fact, he's the first Israelite king to be mentioned this way in other uh, nations' documents. He is known to have conquered Moab, formed an alliance with Tyre, and kept Assyria at bay for quite some time. He had also adopted a policy of toleration for the Canaanite religions perhaps in hopes of reducing the tension between the Israelites and the other tribes nearby. And this is where the biblical record picks up. For we read there in verse 25 that Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all who were before him. It's hard to imagine how it is that he had done more evil. What's remarkable here, though, is that when you look at those extra biblical uh, accountings, they're very positive about what Omri had accomplished. But none of his worldly accomplishments is given much detail at all here in the scriptures. What is recorded for us is that he did not fear the Lord, but did more wickedly than all who had reigned before him. He was successful as a king, but he was faithless as a king over Israel. Remember that Jeroboam's sin was to worship the true God wrongly. We read of this in 1 Kings 12, when the king takes those golden calves and declares that they are the gods of Israel who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Jeroboam set up the calves in Dan and Bethel, appointed feasts as well as priests for offering sacrifices. And so we see here that Omri did even more. Perhaps we might think that he pushed further into the sin of Jeroboam, but I don't think that's all given what happens with Ahab. It seems instead that Omri presses even the worship of other gods there in Israel. Well, verses 27 and 28 recount for us the death of Omri. And it's given in a fairly unspectacular way. Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. Indeed, Baasha and Omri are recorded dying this way. They slept with their fathers, Zimri and Elah. They were the ones who suffered, we can say. We can understand their end. We can understand the judgment against them. But sometimes, God's judgment is leaving someone in their sins until the end. It is not always the case that the wicked suffer in this life. In fact, oftentimes, they do not. That should not make us think that God is not aware. It should not make us think that God does not care. Because again, we read the refrain, He provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. He provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. The last king in our, in our, in our line then is Ahab. It begins with a summary of his reign there in verse 29. Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel, and he reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. A long reign by comparison. It won't be a good reign. It will be a long reign. He did evil, as we read there in verse 30, 
The increase of sin, the pattern that we've seen throughout, seems to get worse and worse because again we read those words, more than all who were before him. Those words that we read in association with Omri, but not with the one, not with the kings before them. There's something about Omri, something about Ahab's reign that seems to go further and further and further away from the Lord. And indeed, look how far Ahab goes. It begins with the wife that he took. In verse 31, as if, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Ahab treated the sins of his predecessors as trivial, as a light thing. And how did he do it? He took them further into pagan worship. It wasn't just about the golden calves, but rather it was about going even further and worshiping Baal. Baal, that storm god. Baal, that god that was supposedly responsible for the rains and the crops and the growth. It's why in the next chapter, Elijah will pray and will shut up the sky and it will not rain. For the Lord is the one who is over the heavens and the earth. The Lord is the one who gives the rain. The Lord is the one who shuts up the rain. It is not Baal. But here we see, we see how Ahab goes further and further away from the Lord, further and further in provoking the God of Israel, taking to himself a foreign wife, a wife who, who worshipped another God. This is what Israel was forbidden from doing in Exodus 34. We read there in verses uh, 15 and 16, as God is saying, you shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their ashram. He says, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, you are invited to eat of his sacrifice and you take of their daughters for your sons and their daughters whore after their gods and make your sons whore after their gods. Here we see that Ahab whored after the god Baal. We read in verse 32 that he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. It wasn't any longer just about worshiping the Lord through the golden calves, but rather there was a new God, his building, his temple erected there in the capital of Israel. He further made an Asherah, and he did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. He did more as if it were done with a particular enmity both toward God and toward Israel. He takes the sins of his father, Omri, the toleration that he had offered up with regard to uh, the worship of false gods or that toleration, and he takes it to a new level. One generation allows for something sinful and the next generation embraces and even promotes it. It's a pattern that we know all too well as we read Scripture. We read of it in the book of Judges as the people over and over and over again give themselves over to false, idolatrous worship. And our passage ends with this peculiar statement. In verse 34, In his days, that is the days of Ahab, Pyle of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiramis firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now you'll find that, that, that language spoken in Joshua chapter 6, after the destruction of Jericho, there in that chapter, after the walls fell down, and, Jer and, and Joshua lays essentially a curse upon the city. Here we see the contagion of Ahab's sin. It goes further than the kings before, and it spreads out to the people so much so that someone is even willing to come and rebuild Jericho. Now we were told in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26 that at the, first, the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. And so here we are told the names of those sons, and at the cost of the, the, the language there, it, it sort of implies a sacrificial offering. So while we can't be certain, it certainly seems possible that Hyle had actually offered up his children to false gods as sacrifice. 
We are told here in this chapter, indeed in this passage, that the Word of God stands across all time. We learn in this chapter that sin spreads more and more. Indeed, leads to greater and greater disobedience. We learn in this chapter that God's judgment was made clear as his anger was provoked. Five kings, five unstable kings, ever increasing provocation, but a steady word from God. Sin begets more sin. Provoking God begets more provoking God. The curse of God, the wrath of God comes upon the people. God's wrath then is the result of provoking sin. God's wrath increases as sin increases. Indeed, God's wrath is poured out upon sin. Beloved, this is what this chapter is teaching us. It is teaching us about the way that sinners provoke God, turning away from Him, deserving His wrath and curse, both in this life and in the life to come. Too often we can come before God and just think, well, as long as, I, as, long as my life isn't so bad, I'll be okay. Or maybe I'll get better and maybe one day I'll I'll have a perfect life. But our need is not merely for a perfect life, but also our need is that there would be someone who would bear the curse that we deserve. Indeed, this is a sad chapter. It would be a sad story if it were the end. But God's word goes on. Yes, covenant curses were spoken and we see here that they were in part fulfilled But this is not all that God's word is declared. For God has promised to redeem his people from the curse. He has spoken words of forgiveness that will be wrought by the death of his only begotten son. Here we dig into the great truth of Christ's active and passive obedience. Christ has fulfilled the law in the place of his people, but more, even more, he has suffered. That's where the word passion or passive comes from, to suffer. His passive obedience is by becoming a curse for us. This is what the New Testament teaches us. Far from this chapter having nothing to do with what goes on in the New Testament, nothing to do with the God of the New Testament, who is a God of love. The Old Testament is also a God of love because there is only one God. And our great need is to be redeemed from the curse. And that is exactly what we read in the New Testament. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And this is what is going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. That passage that we read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, as Jesus goes into the garden and he, he, he seems to wrestle in prayer, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. The cup of God's wrath. The cup that the Old Testament says would be drunk down to the dregs in a similar way as Zimri, as, as, as Elah was drinking himself drunk, so also God would pour out his wrath and he would be drunk all the way down. And here is why Jesus comes. He comes, yes, to show God's love. He comes, yes, as, as, as the visible representation of God's love. And everything that we've been reading in the Gospel of John, as Jesus shows love to the Samaritan woman and shares with her the good news, as Jesus shows love to the man who was born blind, as Jesus shows love to Lazarus and calling him from, from death to life again. But remember where Jesus is going in the Gospel. He is going to the cross. For it is there that he would drink the cup of God's wrath because we have provoked our God with our sin. God pours out his wrath, full strength, undiluted onto his son. He drinks it down to the dregs. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is why 
1 Kings 16 is good news, brothers and sisters. It is good news because it drives us to the cross. It reminds us of what sin deserves. And it helps us to see why it is that our Savior, there in Gethsemane, in agony, prayed, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground because he knew what the cross meant. And yet he willingly offered himself up as a sacrifice for our sins, that he redeems us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. In this way then, as we think about 1 Kings 16, may it move us to rejoice and to give thanks to our God. May we not find ourselves like those kings going further and further away from the Lord, but rather being drawn nearer and nearer to him and trusting ourselves to him more and more, growing in our faith and growing in our gratitude, for he has raised us up from the dust and seated us with Christ in heavenly places. And so let us offer up our thanksgiving and our praise for such wondrous love 